why am I telling you all this? Because I want to stress that the end result of all of this was 30 years, 70s, 80s, 90s now, 30 years of development in which real industrialization takes place in many parts of the third world. You see that develop. And therefore, educational systems begin to develop, and legal systems begin to develop, new ways, of transportation systems, all of that. Impressive industrialization. And I don't want to deny it or take away from it, but I want you to see the particular quality. It is overwhelmingly designed for export. This is not an economic development that is in any sense balanced. It does not balance industry and agriculture or manufacturing and services in terms of developing a complicated, diverse economic system that can adapt to all the unknowns as the future unfolds. It's a system of industrialization that depends on the market above all in the United States. Even more than the market in Europe and Japan, it's the market in the United States fueled by what we've already studied, this explosion of debt and the explosion of work geared to a consumption focus, a consumerism, which is what the third world serves. It produces for, and I'm exaggerating, but it produces for the Western consumer. Everything and anything that is necessary. And, and for example, if you talk to older Americans, they, they, are, you know, they are alive now because they went through the process in which they really felt it every day as they put on their shirts and their pants and their socks over the last 30 years. They no longer were made in America. None of them. They are now made someplace else. We're all used to it. The shirt is from Panama, and the socks are from Nigeria, I mean, wherever. You're not surprised by that. But that was not always so. In fact, for most of the history of the United States, that was not the case. That really is a modern phenomena in which virtually all the consumer goods, clothing, uh, small appliances around the house, now big appliances around the house, you know, not just cheap goods, but now luxury goods, everything is produced in one another of these places by industrial workers working with machinery in a factory, but it's a third world industrial uh, activity. And this has consequences, all kinds of complicated consequences. It means, yes, is there economic development in the last 30 years? Is there industrialization in the third world? Yes. Is industrialization moving from the advanced world to the third world? Yes. Heavy industry, and for some of you this is important, dirty, polluting industry, leaves. It leaves the Western world. It's resettled. It's the third world in which the pollution is not produced en masse, in which the waste is thrown in the rivers, on the ground. You know, one of the things most famous uh, utterances by our great leader there, Lawrence Summers, one of the leading economic advisors, is that famous remark of his about where, you know, the research he did as an economist about where you ought to dump toxic waste in the world. You know, the way that he meant by toxic waste, the stuff that comes out of chemical plants and, you know, energy and spent uranium and stuff like that. And he did a little calculation the way he was taught in graduate school of economics. And he said, well, you should only pollute the least valuable land. And by valuable, he meant how much it costs. So he looked around the world for the cheapest land, because that's where you should dump toxic waste. You wouldn't want to use expensive land. Mm -hmm. So where do you look? <laughs> My colleague is in the university. It's hard to take them seriously, especially if you know them personally. Um, anyway, so what did he figure out? Well, he figured out you should dump it where the land is cheap. Where is the land is cheap? Well, where the people are poor. That's how it works. So where should you dump toxic waste? Well, I'm poor people. Are. <laughs> Next question. You know, straightforward. You know, any, poor Mr. Summers, he, you know, he has a history of putting his foot right in his mouth. And uh, so he, he made that public along with his insights about the incapacity of women to do science and things like that. It got him into a lot of trouble, although it didn't prevent him from being a very high official, as you can see. So maybe it's good to say things like that if it's you, if it's you up there. Um, but that kind of re 
reasoning is actually a mirror of what was going on. We do, in fact, by the way, ship toxic waste to Africa and dump it there. We've been doing it for decades. Uh, before that, to Virginia. Yes. To poor neighbors. And yes, but we don't do that in Virginia anymore. The air in New York, if you, ever, if you ever take a look at the quality of the air in New York over the last 40 years, you can see what I'm describing the same thing. All of the industries have polluted the air in New York that they didn't have qualities like you now find in Mexico City or Beijing and places like that. Those are gone. We, we have relocated production all over the world. Not all of it, but a major movement so that the third world is getting not only uh, industry, they are, and all the positives that go with that, but they also get all the negatives. And it produces a kind of a, a, a bizarre culture in our country. For example, one of the fav most favorite activities of the New York Times is to put an article on the front page in which horrible details are given about the pollution in Chinese cities. Ah, of course. That's so point. And this newspaper was very, very leery of doing that for all the decades that that was done right here, like within a few blocks of the New York Times. It, it, it didn't find this to be an important topic. But the minute it's somewhere else, we can wax poetic about the horror of people you know, making fires to cook their food out of plastic cans and thereby breathing horrible chemicals and all the rest of it. So one of the things I want to stress to you is that the third world became dependent on the market for its exports. Its whole industrial structure became dependent. I want to be sure you understand that. If you build an industry, you rearrange your society. People who used to be scattered on the land doing agriculture are now pulled off the land and concentrated in small areas, which we call cities. They don't live on the land. They live you know, vertically instead of horizontally. They live in apartment houses. They live in dense tenement structures. They begin to depend on one another in all kinds of ways that are different from the way people in rural areas can try at least to get some modicum of self-sufficiency by growing their own food. If none of that's possible, you really are interdependent and hurt the way you know you are if you live in New York City. Everything about a society changes, its culture, its politics. They change themselves, often in a generation, many of these third world countries, to build an industry focus on the consumption of the mass of people in the Western world. Try then to get a sense, if you can, because it's the punchline for today, what it would mean to such societies after 30 years of putting their entire bet on something that has now collapsed. Because that's their problem. They have no customers. They can't sell the stuff. There's no prospect of them renewing the ability to sell the stuff. What in the world are they going to do? It takes a long time to rearrange a society. Even if they could find the purchasing power in their own country to produce for their own people, and they can't. But even if they could, it would take a long time to reposition the roads, the highways, the skills, the, the housing, all the rest of it, to do all that. That's a very complicated process. It took them 30 plus years to go from where they were to where they are now. They're not going to solve the next problem in a year or two or three or six. It's not going to happen. Can't. It's not their fault. It's just the way this has evolved. And that is going to mean very serious social problems <coughs> across the third world. And for those of you that are you know, in the work of the UN or coming through the GPIA and thinking of, about a job that takes you into the third world, Pay attention there, because this is going to affect where you are posted, what you do, the conditions you work with, the chances of success on the projects you work on, and so on, in a very tangible way. Somebody, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, also the people that move from those countries here and no longer have jobs, and then the money is not being sent back to their families, right. and they are suffering from Yeah. Well, I was going to get to it a little later, but let me get to it now. In many of these countries, the number of jobs, even with rapid industrialization, was never enough, never enough, to handle the end of the agricultural universe that they had lived in for hundreds of years. 
So try to think. There's no coordination here. So what you have is a the end of the old agricultural system, the end of jobs in that area, the end of land often in that area, the use of the land for other things and so forth, the trans transformation of self-sufficient agriculture, little family plants.